got you right-handed. I knew you would do that. Oh, what a great day to celebrate. Uh, our dads and our city is in uh, a joyful uh, environment these days, and so should the church, should be a joyful environment, a place to have so much fun and rejoicing because of all that God has done uh, in our lives and in our families. I'm blessed with a great dad, and I don't usually get to celebrate Father's Day uh, with my dad because they live in Vancouver, but my parents are here today. Where are you? There you are. Love my dad, love my mom. They have been a huge impact to my life. And uh, talking about jokes, my dad is the biggest jokester I know. And uh, there's two questions that my dad asks me and many people, even people that are strangers. Uh, when I take him out, I'm like, Dad, just give me a break, man. And uh, he'll ask you this, do you love Jesus? <laughs> do you love Jesus? It's a good question, isn't it? Because we can get uh, caught up with a whole lot of religious routine and our love for God can wane very easily. Do you love Jesus today? And then he'll ask, how are you tomorrow? What kind of a question is that? How are you tomorrow? It's a good question, though, because uh, we have choices to make, and uh, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow, and that is our God. And we can walk knowing that our lives are in his hands. But this morning, I understand that Father's Day brings all sorts of different emotions in a room like this. Uh, those of you who are present and those of, uh, of you who are watching on the live stream, we welcome you. Um, so many different emotions. For some of us, as Pastor Kevin said in the worship set, we haven't had such a great role model in our dads. And so Father's Day kind of brings to the surface some of those challenges and, and, and those uh, difficulties that, that have arisen from our earthly father relationships. And for some of us today, we've lost our dad. And dad is no longer with you. And today you uh, feel the, the, the loss, the sting of not being with dad today. And for others of us, uh, we have always dreamt and hoped to be a dad and for a variety of reasons have not uh, become a dad as of yet. And so with that comes all sorts of other emotions. But, but today I want us to talk about fatherhood, but I want us to think and learn from our heavenly father, learning to father from our heavenly father. You see, uh, I, I believe that our heavenly father is the perfect figure. He is a father to every single one of us, whether you've had a dad that, that has been present or a dad that has not been present. You have a father in heaven who is perfect and does it right every single day. And so today we want to learn to be fathers from our heavenly father, and, and there's a key verse in scripture that I think is so filled with, with truths for us to learn from today. And it's found in Matthew 3, verse 16. And it's a key moment in the life of Jesus. He is commencing his ministry. He's uh, about to be water baptized by John the Baptist. And there's a moment where he connects with his father in this, <clears throat> excuse me, in this key moment in his life. And the word of the Lord says this in Matthew 6, 16, 6, 360. <coughs> I'm getting all excited, Pastor Aaron, that I can't even talk anymore. Thank you so much. Listen to the word of the Lord today. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was open. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said this, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. This verse is, is for us today. This verse is for us to meditate on and to think about. We're going to learn how to be a father from our heavenly father today. We'll notice right off the bat in this verse is that fathers are present. The best dads are the dads that are present. And you'll notice in this passage that is exactly what's going on in the life of Jesus. You see, at a key moment in his life, his father was there. At the commencement of his ministry, the father spoke from the heavens. And not only did he speak uh, to Jesus, but, but once Jesus came out of the water, the Holy Spirit 
descended and rested on him. This was a sign that God was present with his son. God the Father would always be present with his son. And so if God the Father thought it was important to let the whole world know that he was present with his son, how much more important is it for dads today to be present with their children? Now, there's a difference between being present and kind of being around. Are you fully engaged in the life of your children? Are you fully present with them? Are you giving them your attention? Are you investing intentionally in their life? I want to coin this phrase today, and it's a thought that I've had this week. Incarnational fathering is key. Incarnational fathering is key. That word incarnation means to be present. Jesus was an example of this. He left the heavenly places and came and became present into our lives and into our neighborhoods. He moved into our space. We know this because in Philippians 2, 5 to 7, Paul writes these words, in your relationships with one another, including relationships between children and their fathers and their parents, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. So here's the example. Jesus being in very nature God left the heavenly places and came and lived amongst us. Incarnational fathering is a challenge to all of us that we would be present with our children as well, leaving our own things behind and making them a priority. As this passage says, in your relationships with one another, may your attitude be the same as that of Christ Jesus. For today's purposes, let's read this passage with the role of the Father in mind. Jesus intentionally set aside his position and entered into the world to save us. Incarnational fathering includes an intentional setting aside of the me in order to enter into the them. You'll see that on the screen. Incarnational fathering includes an intentional setting aside of the me, the things that perhaps fill my time or that I enjoy, in order to enter into the them, into the life of my children, What does this practically look like in our everyday life? For example, maybe it's trying to learn what they like, perhaps the music that they like. Now, for some of us, Dad, we we don't want to know and hear the music that they like. We prefer our own type of music. In fact, we tell them to shut that off. But perhaps there's something about moving into their circle, moving into their life, and learning what they are interested in. Perhaps it's the movies that they enjoy. Perhaps it's the extracurricular activities that they enjoy. Depending on the age of our children, it's perhaps getting down to the level of a toddler and building something with Legos. It's detaching ourselves from the the me, and engaging in the them. I know my children went into this phase, and, and, and I want to see, we should start a support group for this, but, but a phase of Pokemon. Guys, anybody know what that is? Pokemon, are you kidding me? And, and they battle against each other, and some have extra powers, and there's water and fire and, and all sorts of things, and Pokemon, the mon of Pokey, I mean, come on. And I did my very best, although, to be honest, was the least of interest to me. Try to learn this whole game of Pokemon. In many ways, incarnational fathering includes an intentional setting aside of the me in order to enter into the them. Because great fathers are present. They're where their children are. The Father in heaven was present for Jesus all the days of his life. 
Unfortunately, the reality is that many children grow up without a present father. In fact, according to Father Facts, uh, it says this, in America, 24.7 million children, 33%, lived in a biologically father-absent home in 2010. And these numbers are only increasing in the years uh, ahead. And 20.3 million lived with no father, a biological adoptive or stepdad in their home. Friends, there are huge ramifications in the life of our children and in the life of our culture and society when dads aren't present where their children are. Uh, an example of this is a well-known uh, rap star by the name of Eminem. You may have heard of him. With 11 Grammy Awards, Eminem is the biggest selling rapper of the last decade. So it is clear the message in his style of music is resonating and connecting with a very diverse audience but especially young men. And so when I had heard about that, I, I started to delve in a little bit. What is it about Eminem that is engaging with young men in particular that has made him one of the most popular rap stars ever? And I do not recommend his music, but this is a reality. What is it about Eminem that engages a young demographic of men? Well, in his autobiographical song entitled, Cleaning Out My Closet, his rage is palpable. When he speaks about his father who abandoned him when he was only eight months old, when he was just a few months old, he says this, I wonder if he even kissed me goodbye. No, on second thought, I just wish he would die. And so you see the pain in this young man's life. And so although we just look at a, at a rap star and we look at him and, and we have our own stereotypical ideas about him, there's a story behind the man, isn't there? There's a story of being growing up without ever having a present father. And when a reporter asked if he'd like to meet his father, he said this, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Some people ask me that, and I, I, I don't think I, I really do want to meet my dad. You see, because he goes on to say, if my kids were moved to the edge of the earth, I'd find them. No doubt in my mind. I wouldn't let money stop me from finding them. I wouldn't let anything stop me from finding them. If I had nothing, I'd find my kids just the same. So there's no excuse. There's no excuse for him not to try to find them. The reality is, it's a story of many in our culture where they have missed out on a present father. We need to ask ourselves, what is it that causes dads to be absent? And there's a variety of reasons, and it's complicated, I understand. But at times, it's our broken marriages, our difficulties with our spouses, and our relationship with our spouses become estranged. And next thing you know, we're being estranged from our very own children as well. And that divorce has huge implications on our children many times. For some men, it's simply selfishness. So consumed with our own careers and our own reputation and our own uh, accumulation of wealth that, that our children are simply not on the high on the priority list. For others, it's addictions. For many men, addictions create huge gaps between them and their children because the addictions in their lives end up controlling them. For others, it's workaholism. And I think this is a big one that a lot of us men struggle with. And many times we justify it. We say, well, it's our way of providing for my family. And so we work long, long hours. And it cuts into our family time. And although it is a biblical principle to be a provider for your family, friends, one of the greatest things you can provide for your family is presence. It's to be there and to be fully engaged in the life of 
of your children. And so this morning, the first piece we learned from our Heavenly Father, he was present. He was touching Jesus. He came down and was present with Jesus in a key moment in his life and in the the key moments of, of his entire life. Secondly, fathers acknowledge their children. Fathers acknowledge their children. You notice in this verse, the Father from heaven spoke from the heavens and said what? He says, this is my son. This is my son. The Father in heaven wanted the entire world to know that Jesus was his son. God the Father leaves no ambiguity surrounding his relationship with Jesus Christ. He wants this to be clear as day for all of us. This is my son. Sadly, there are countless individuals who long for their father's acknowledgement, who long for their father's uh, 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 affirmation, but never receive it. I studied this week uh, of a Jewish tradition, which, which I think brings so much benefit and, and symbolism it, it, when, we, when we speak of fatherhood. And this Jewish tradition, this ceremony that the Jewish community participates in is, is entitled the Act of Redemption. And this Act of Redemption ceremony uh, includes and encompasses on the 31st day of, of the firstborn child. Uh, The father and his family bring their child to the rabbi. And when the father approaches the altar with the child, he is asked if he desires to leave the child or redeem the child. And if the father chooses to redeem the child, he hands over some special coins, in a sense, symbolic of payment to the rabbi. And the rabbi pronounces three times in the presence of the company of people there at the ceremony, he says, your son is redeemed. And afterwards, the child is returned to the father. And in many ways, the father is given a choice. Would you rather have the money or would you rather have your child? You choose. And so in this ceremony, the father literally chooses their son, 31 days old, to be their father, to be present. He acknowledges in front of all those witnesses, this is my son. The implications of this ceremony could be very beneficial for us today. You see, the father publicly acknowledges that he accepts full responsibility for his son before God and the people that are there. The son grows up knowing, and this is really important, this son grows up knowing that his dad had a choice to leave him or redeem him, And knowing that he has a father who wanted him and chose him was great and powerful and has spiritual, emotional, and psychological implications in the life of that son. Your sons and your daughters need to hear you say, I am so glad you're my son. I'm so glad that you are my daughter. They need your acknowledgement. They need your acknowledgement. Sadly, I have heard the words spoken, I wish you weren't born. You have been nothing but trouble in my life. Friends, those words break our children. They have destructive capabilities in the life of our children. May those words never come out of our mouths. And if they have, it's time to repent from those words, seek forgiveness from your children, and begin to speak words of acknowledgement over your children. Our children need to know from their dads that they have chosen them, that they acknowledge them as their child, even over the materialism of our world. You see, just like this Jewish father would would hand over the money as symbolism, that, that this child would go as the priority one of their list over all the accumulation of wealth. You see, when we as dads struggle with workaholism and, and gaining more and more accumulation of wealth at the expense 
of being present with our children in many ways where we're choosing money over our children. See, our children should come before our work. Our children should come before our career aspiration. Our children must be more important than our reputations. Our children must be more important than our own pleasures and enjoyments. As dads and and as parents today, the danger zone is when our children make bad decisions and we're tempted to disown them and or sever our relationship with them. It is instead precisely at these very points when we must be clear with our children that no matter what, they will always be acknowledged as our children. May we be compassionate fathers to our children. Psalms 103 says this, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are us. Friends, our compassion towards our children is critical. And I, and I think if you're a parent here today, you know that there's those moments when we see our children make some horrible decisions or some decisions that, that we would have never imagined perhaps that they would make that really wound us and discourage us. But, but may in those moments, just like the father looks down on your life and my life and When we royally mess up, he looks at us with compassion, doesn't he? His heart is burdened for us, even when we make those mistakes. And and he cries out, oh, would you make the right decision? Would you get back on the rails? Because I have so much for you. It's that same compassion as earthly parents and fathers that that we should feel well up in our hearts when our when our children make those mistakes, rather than severing the relationships. We are moved with compassion. In fact, there's a 26-year-long study. Researchers found that the number one factor in developing empathy in our children, the number one factor in, in, in seeing our children be raised to be compassionate people themselves, was father involvement in their life that their dad was involved in their lives. When children have involved fathers, the chances of them growing up to be empathetic to others and compassionate to others goes right through the roof. Fathers spending regular time alone with their children translated into children who became compassionate adults themselves. We are training up future moms and dads, aren't we? And so in those moments of difficulty, may we be men and parents of compassion. And part of that is to acknowledge, as the Father did in heaven, this is my son. I want the whole world to know that. May we acknowledge our own children as well. And when they mess up, rather than detaching yourself, may you be moved with compassion. Thirdly, this morning, Father's love. Great dads love their children. Notice what the father in heaven says to his son. This is my son, say it with me, who I love. The father in heaven spoke the words, didn't he? I love you, son. Not only am I present here today, not only do I want everybody to know that you are my kid, but I want you to know and everybody else that I love you. Wow. When was the last time you said to your son or daughter that you loved them? Ah, they know already that I love them. Look what I've done for them. No, you need to say it. And then you need to live it. You see, the Heavenly Father's love towards Jesus was not only mere words. His love for Jesus was expressed in tangible ways in his life. We know that Jesus felt and understood the Father's love for a variety of reasons. And as I thought about this, I thought, there's a reason why many times Jesus wanted to leave the crowds of people and find a quiet place to be with his Father. Jesus actually enjoyed to be with his dad. Why? Because he knew that was a safe place. He knew that that was a place of love. He knew that his father loved him. So he couldn't wait 
to wake up early at times, and he couldn't wait to, to remove himself from the crowds of people so that he can engage with his father. He could do that because he knew his father loved him. Would you agree? Help me out here this morning. All right, come on. We also know that Jesus understood the Father's love because one day the disciples asked them, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? And the very first thing Jesus teaches them is that when you pray, start like this. Our Father. Our Dad. Our, the, the word there in the original language is, is an intimate word. It's Papa. It's Daddy. And so right there, Jesus is trying to help the disciples know that when you go to God and you're praying, it's not this father who's far off, who's in no relationship with you. No, he's a safe father, a good, good father who loves you. And you can climb up on his lap and say, Papa, here's my situation. So Jesus understood that Papa relationship himself. He understood the love of his father. This is my son whom I love whom I love. So many times as dads, we think our only responsibility is to provide food, clothing, and shelter. Now that is important, and that is honorable to do, but there's so much to, more to fathering than that. Our children have other needs as well. We have the privilege of being fathers who live in close proximity loving proximity with our children so we can best know how to meet their needs and show them our love. 1 John 3, 1 says something powerful and beautiful. It says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. I love that verse. Our Father in heaven, every single person here has been lavished with love from the Father. That's our example. May we not go cheap when it comes to showing and vocalizing our love to our children. May we not go cheap there. Vocalizing our love to our children is important. Words of affection, words of praise are critical. And remember, we can praise them even when they've given their best effort. So when they come home with the report card and it's a, it's a B or a B plus or something else. May we not right away jump to, hey, where's the A? Perhaps you celebrate what they did get and then maybe a day later talk about it. Of how you can help them even get even better. You see, those words of affirmation, those words of love are critical in the lives of our children. The way fathers love their children has a direct impact as to how your children perceive what God is like. Think about that. That's massive, isn't it? The way we love our children has a direct impact as to how our children perceive what God is like. The attributes of God are amazing, aren't they? He is love. He is just. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's available. He protects. He provides. How are we doing? Exemplifying the character of God to our children. Because it has a direct impact to their perception of what God is like. Ephesians 6, 4 says this, Fathers, don't exasperate your children. Another translation says, don't provoke your children by coming down too hard on them. Take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the master. Sometimes we can come down hard. Sometimes too hard. And we push our kids and provoke them, exasperate them. And Paul reminds us, avoid that. Instead, take them by the hand and show them the way of the Father. Rather than exasperating or provoking, let us exhibit love to our children. Love is filled with grace, but it is filled with truth. It does include discipline. 
You see, God disciplines his children. We know that in the scripture. Hebrews 12 says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Why? Because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Remember, godly discipline is not done when you're angry. You see, it's in those moments of emotion and those frustration that, that it's there where we need to be really careful that we, 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 we discipline our children appropriately. My hunch is when we discipline in a fit of anger, we're probably doing more harm than good. Gather your emotions, gather your control, harness that energy, and when you're ready, grab your child from the hand and lead them down the right path that the Father has for them. Trying to starve our kids relationally in hopes that one day they will come groveling back to us is probably not our best option either. And sometimes as dads, that's what we do. We give our kids the silent treatment. And we say, you know what? Until you get your act together, I don't even want to see you or talk to you. It's interesting, the prodigal son story, a wonderful parable that Jesus shares. It's a powerful, powerful example of the lavish love of God over our lives. Prodigal son, as you know, spent all the inheritance his father gave to him, squandered it all, had nothing to show for it. The scripture says, finally, that son comes to his senses and starts making his way back home. And and he's thinking to himself, when I get home, I'm going to try to convince my dad to just let me be one of his servants. He doesn't even need to accept me back as a son because of all that I've done. I'll just be one of his servants. It's better to be there as a servant than to be feeding swine with nothing in my life. And the scripture says this, when this son's returning home, but when while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and he was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. This message, specific word is for somebody in this place right now. And perhaps your own children have wounded you, they've hurt you, they've disappointed you. But friend, pray that they would come to their senses. And when they do, run to them and embrace them. You see, for for a father in a patriarchal society to run through the community would, would have been seen as a disgrace. Patriarchs don't run, children run. They would have had long robes. They would have shown more of his legs, which would have been very uh, unheard of in, in a patriarchal society. But this father, this dad doesn't care what other people think. He runs across town and all the other patriarchs who are sitting in their porches are seeing him run. They know his, his son has royally messed up. What is he going there for? Is he running to beat him up? And they're waiting for this confrontation to occur. And and they look into the horizon and this father runs across town. And rather than than beating his son, he embraces, he hangs on him. And he kisses him. And he gives him his ring. And he puts sandals on his feet. And he calls his servants and he says, kill the fattened calf because my son who was lost is now found. That is the amazing love of God. And sometimes as dads, we harbor so much bitterness and anger towards our children that we won't allow ourselves to be moved with compassion amidst all the heartache and all the pain. Just grab that kid and give them your embrace. Allow the Spirit of God to descend in that very moment and begin a healing process in your lives. God is in the business of restoring families. Father's love. Fathers also, and finally today, affirm. Fathers affirm. You notice, lastly, in this monumental moment in the life of Jesus, the Father has been present. He came down as a dove, placing his touch upon his son. He acknowledges to everybody 
that this is my son. He expresses his love, whom I love. And then he says, with him, I am well pleased. That's powerful words. The father in heaven validates his son in front of everybody who was present. You see, what makes this remarkable is that at this very moment in the life of Jesus, he hasn't accomplished anything. He hasn't healed anybody. He hasn't preached to the masses. He hasn't freed people of demon possession. He hasn't done any miracles. He hasn't turned water into wine. He hasn't done any of that. And yet the father speaks these words over his son's life. With you, I am well pleased. Why is this so critical at such a critical moment in the life of Jesus? The heavenly father validates his son before his son accomplishes anything. You see, Jesus does not need to now start ministering in hopes that his father would one day validate him because of his performance. No, rather he can start ministry knowing his father has already validated him. God's validation over our life is not based on our performance. The father validates and loves us unconditionally. This means we are free to serve him without the fear of being rejected. We can serve without trying to prove ourselves to the father and others around us. This helps us when criticism comes our way. We don't get devastated because we know that our validation comes from what the Father in heaven thinks of us. And it's important and imperative that as dads, we affirm our children. We affirm our children. It's sometimes easy to point out the deficiencies in our children. And I'm not saying that there isn't good growth conversations that can, can, that can, can happen in a relationship between a dad and a son or daughter. But sometimes I have a hunch we focus more on the deficiencies than what is great about our children. You see, affirmation is powerful, isn't it? Affirmation is powerful and we all need it desperately. There are some of you in this room that never received the affirmation of their dad. And you have been living your entire life for people's affirmation because of that gap. You've been doing everything you can to be validated by others. And you have worked yourself to the bone to be validated by others. I just want you to know, you've already been validated. You have a heavenly father today. And this may these be healing words in your life. Who breathes life in you today and says, you're my kid. And yes, your earthly father may not have validated you, but I want you to know I created you. My, my fingerprints are all over your life. I have a purpose and a plan for your life. And I just want you to know today that I love you. And I am pleased with you. Yes, you've made mistakes, but my love for you is not based on your performance. My love on, on you is based on the fact that you're my kid. Receive that today. And dads, may you be challenged today to speak those words of affirmation in your children's lives. Jenny Catron said this, if leaders see somebody's potential and call that out of them, that gift of belief will cause them to rise to the occasion. I believe this could be a great principle for us dads. Rather than focusing on your children's deficiencies, why don't you start looking at that potential you see in them and calling that potential out and believing in them? Because if you do that, they might rise to the occasion. I conclude with these words as the worship team comes up. Proverbs 14, 26 has this beautiful analogy, this beautiful picture for us today. It says this, whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress. And for their children, it will be a refuge. Let's unpack that together. Whoever fears the Lord. You see, the greatest thing you can do for your children is to fear the Lord, 
to live a life that is fully devoted to the Lord, a life that says, Lord, I want to please you with everything in my life. I want to please you more than my boss. I want to please you more than my friends. I want to please you, Lord. When you live your life fearing the Lord, you have a secure fortress. Your home is not a dilapidated home. It is fully secure with the best security you can find. It is a secure fortress. And because of your fear of God, not only is that secure fortress yours to live in, but it's for your children to take refuge in. Powerful, isn't it? Because of your fear of the Lord, you build yourself for your family a secure fortress. And that secure fortress becomes a refuge for your children. A place where they know is safe. A place where they know they can do life where they can grow, where they can be corrected, where they can be encouraged. It's a safe refuge for them. It was October 2016. And rescue workers had been laboring for over 12 hours at the site of four collapsed residential buildings in China. Recently, when they discovered one final survivor in the rubble, a three-year-old girl wrapped tightly in the arms of her dead father, Wu Ningzi was found buried deep in the massive pile of crumbled cement where the old buildings, poorly constructed, overcrowded, and rain-laden once stood. Rescue workers made the discovery of Wu's body when they removed a thick cement pillar to find her father's body draped over her. Shielding her from the crushing weight of the building, he was 26 years old. This little three-year-old only sustained minor injuries. And one worker told the reporters this, the child was able to survive entirely thanks to the fact that her dad used his own flesh and blood to prop up a life-saving space for his daughter. I love this picture of a father literally creating a safe place, putting his own life on the line to ensure that his daughter would be safe and be able to live a fruitful life in the years ahead. Friends, we do that when we fear the Lord. When we fear God and put him at the top of our list, in many ways, we're protecting our children. We're putting a covering over them. We're building a fortress so that it could be their place of refuge. Greatest gift you can give your kids. Every dad has an instinct to protect their children. Don't mess with my kids. One of the greatest things to protect your children with is to have a fear of God in your life. Because you'll build a fortress which will become their refuge. Andy Stanley put it this way. It's a great challenge us, a challenge for us all. The greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do, but someone you raise. Let's raise giants of faith, shall we? Let's raise a next generation that will bring our ministries and our kingdom impact to the very next level. They'll surpass us by miles because we've built them a fortress where they can go to care, a great refuge of safety, 